Hello, everybody. My name is Stefan Frost. Uh, thank you for coming to the talk today. Um, we're going to be talking about production and the creative process uh, and how you facilitate creativity. If you want to find me online, you can check me out and add me on LinkedIn. I, I add anybody that wants to add me on there. Or you can find me at Stefan Frost on Twitter. Uh, so this is the overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, as you can see, we've got a lot to go through. Uh, hopefully, we'll go through ample amounts uh, in a short amount of time. And then at the end, uh, we'll leave it open to questions. So if you guys have questions about anything we discussed today or getting into the game industry or any questions about that stuff, I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions for you. Uh, so who am I? My name is Stefan Frost. Uh, I've worked at these companies. Right now, I am a creative director at Nuxon. Uh, I am working on an unannounced PC title. I can't talk about that, unfortunately. Um, but we are working on that uh, right now. It's kind of in the earlier stages. I just started with them about two months ago. Before that, I was at Blizzard Entertainment. Um, I worked on the World of Warcraft team as a senior design producer. Um, worked with them for about two years, so if you're a WoW player, uh, I worked on Legion and the raids, the dungeons, the mobile app that went along with it, um, trade skills, a whole bunch of other stuff, classes, uh, PvP, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, uh, before that, I was at Amazon for a bit, at uh, Amazon Game Studios, which is in Orange County, California. Before that, I was at Carbine Studios working on the game Wildstar. Um, I was a producer there as well. Before that, uh, I worked at WayForward Technologies. I was a level designer working on Batman the Brave and the Bold, uh, as well as a couple other titles in development before going to Carbine. And before that, I was at uh, Disney Interactive Studios and a place in Utah that I did not put up here because nobody knows who it is anyway, so I uh, didn't put it up there. That's also my wife and child right there. He's, uh, he's one in that picture, but he's, he's two now. He's a lot bigger. Uh, so what does a producer do is a question that I get constantly. People are like, well, what exactly is a producer? Well, according to Wikipedia, these are all of the, the definitions. Uh, and we have stuff like negotiating contracts, uh, developing and maintaining schedules, overseeing creative, uh, ensuring there's a timely delivery of products, scheduling stuff. Uh, and some of this I would say that we do. Um, some of it I would say that we don't do as much. And really, the company that you go to, it kind of depends on what your job is. Smaller companies usually you do everything and maybe even some stuff that's not in your job description. Um, bigger companies, they usually find a, a niche specifically for you to kind of focus on. I work with design teams, for example, at multiple larger teams. But um, what does a producer do, really? Um, it's this, mostly, just getting upset at people, like, why do you keep adding things? Um, so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about what this is. If you don't know, by the way, this, this is mostly for people that are maybe not as familiar with production. Um, and so it's, or if you do know, maybe you'll, you'll pick up some stuff too. But this is a burn down chart. If you're not familiar with what that is, um, this is the level of effort, meaning the amount of stuff that we have to do in a certain amount of time. Uh, and this is the estimate of how it's supposed to go. Uh, this is usually what happens. People add stuff and then, oh no, no, we, we need to add more stuff. And so usually it just means that producers are stressing out and figuring out why that stuff is. So we'll talk about how you can actually deal with stuff like this uh, a little bit later. So what does a producer not do? Uh, we don't design the game. Uh, we don't write anything like uh, stories or narratives or come up with cool characters or anything like that. Uh, we don't do the art. We don't make any of the 3D models. We don't do anything concept art, nothing like that. Engineering, we don't do coding. By the way, this is for you coders in here. This is, I made everybody Neo. I hope you appreciate that. It's my compliment to you. Uh, and uh, other things we don't do, enjoy life in general. We just don't do that. Uh, <laughs> we, don't, we don't get to do the fun stuff. It's funny, everybody that comes up to me, they're like, oh, you work in games, so you must come up with all the cool characters and stuff, right? It's like, no, that's not what I do. Um, so it, a lot of times there are producers that get into this industry and they think that they're going to do some of or any of these things. Really, the focus needs to be on getting the project done. That's what matters, right? And the, some of the worst, when I was a designer, um, I would work with producers that would kind of go, you know, you should do this. It's like, dude, this, this is not your job. Your job is to help me get this stuff done uh, and figure out how to remove roadblocks and stuff like that. Uh, so as a point of advice, if you are looking to become a producer in the video game field and you have a passion for game design, just do game design. Um, 
or if you are sincerely passionate about how to remove roadblocks from projects and track stuff and understand risk uh, and things like that, do production. But um, there's been a lot of times where the, I think some of the worst producers that I've worked with have meddled too much and it usually makes the product bad and it usually makes the people that are working in these fields uh, feel like they don't have autonomy or ownership and that is not a good thing. So. My suggestion, if you're looking to get into production, just stick to doing the producer thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what producers actually do and what they work with. Um, these are the main tools and constraints uh, that a producer has to work with. It's time, it's team size, and it's scope of deliverable. So uh, if I were to use this as an example, or in an example that is totally factual uh, and applicable to stuff that happens in real life, I would use Nick Fury kind of as an example of what a producer is. So if, you, if we look at, uh, you guys have seen The Avengers, right? Solid movie, right? I'm very excited about the next one that's coming out. Nick Fury is kind of like a producer in a lot of ways. He's, uh, you know, he's noticing that there's some bad stuff going on, like, uh, say, I don't know, uh, Loki is gonna invade New York City, right? So he knows that Loki is gonna invade New York City. He's, uh, he's got this Tesseract thing that's, that's bad news. And that he's also facilitating all of these aliens that are gonna come down from the sky, cause chaos, and usher in a new era with Thanos behind them, right? All of that bad, right? That is a problem to solve. And so uh, what we need to kind of do is go, what do we need to get this done? That's a producer's job. If we need to solve this problem, defeat Loki, defeat this massive army and a big ass worm thing that flies, how are we gonna do that? Well, we have to look at those constraints that I was talking about before. So first, it's who do we need on this team and how big does this team need to be, right? So there's, uh, I think in the trailer, they're always talking about like, we wanted to form a team so that we could have people solve the problems that no one else could solve, right? So when you're, when you're thinking about a project, it's, it's kind of a problem that you need to solve if you think about it. Um, you know, there is a, there's a game that needs to be made. It has not been made. Let's solve that problem. So to do that, you'll need things like artists and designers and sound people and QA and engineers and uh, producers to do that. And so it's, it's kind of about looking at what this is. So in, in this case, we need CAP you know, because he's a good leader and we need Iron Man because he's got all this stuff to do that. Um, and maybe you have a small amount of time, right? So you think, okay, well, if I have a small amount of time, maybe I can get more people. And that comes with its own set of problems and coordination things that you have to worry about because you need to make sure everybody is working together and communicating. But it's a way to kind of solve a problem if your time is limited. So let's say that this is pretty good, but we're gonna need I don't know, an extra coder to get stuff done faster, so we'll add War Machine. I hope you guys appreciate that animation. It took me two hours to do that, so it's real difficult. That's not true. It took me a couple seconds. But uh, the other sort of thing that we can talk about is time. Let's say that somebody wants uh, something in a certain amount of time, uh, and it's not doable with the team size that you have. Well, can you get more time? That's one of the things that you can have in your, your tool belt as a producer to try to figure out how much time can we actually get to do this. Sometimes uh, if you are working in something like, um, I don't know, say you're working on a licensed product. Let's say it's an Avengers game. Uh, and th there's a movie coming out in 2019. And we have to have the game out by that time. That means w we need to figure out what is the end date, what is the last possible moment that we can work on this thing so that it can go into production of... Um, uh, things like printing the CDs, getting the booklets made, having marketing push it, everything, right? We need to have all that stuff done by this time. That movie is not moving. So that means that we really can't add more time. So maybe we can make the team bigger um, or we can reduce the scope, right? The amount of stuff that we are going to do as a thing. But time is, is always uh, something that you'll notice your team is like, oh, we, we don't have enough time, we, we, we need to do these things. But something that I've uh, found and I'd heard from a producer that worked at uh, Gearbox, he had said that if he had infinite time and infinite money, he actually wouldn't want that. Constraints, I think, actually kind of push stuff forward and having sort of goals and ideas set, I think actually get people to do stuff as opposed to, eh, we'll just spend lots of time on the thing, right? Um, but it's a factor in when you need to do planning. Uh, so 
Scope is the other thing that I was talking about before. So let's say that uh, we tell the Avengers that we need them in New York within two days, and they need to be prepared to fight all these aliens. Let's say that Tony Stark is working on a new prototype suit, and he's, he says, uh, hey, I've been working on this new thing, okay, it's really awesome, it's called the Hulkbuster, it's really good, in case Hulk goes nuts, I just wanna have it in there. And so someone like Nick Fury might ask, do you really need the Hulkbuster though for this time around? Because maybe we need to get this done in a certain amount of time, how long is it gonna take you to get that done? And his response might be, uh, four days, but the aliens are coming in two days, so maybe what we should do is scrap that and save it for the sequel because then we'll have this new thing that we can bring in that's really cool. And just like they did in the Avengers. Just gotta tie that in, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I also wanted to talk about um, things that I've learned from working at different places, and uh, mostly it's from failure. Um, a lot of, I think a ton of what I have learned in my career has been through either me messing up or other people messing up and saying, I don't wanna do that again. So uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, so I worked on the game Wildstar at Carbine, and when I got there, um, one of the things that I had noticed was we would work on quest content, and people would play it, and they'd say, eh, it's not good. And then the, the leaders at the top would say, you guys need to go back and do it again. And so this is frustrating, obviously, for uh, a myriad of reasons, but the biggest one is that uh, if you spend a lot of time on something and somebody tells you that it's not good, that's... Uh, that's not great, right? It doesn't feel good. And so um, I had uh, I'd booked a meeting because I went up to one of the teams and I said, has the lead played through this? Uh, when was the last time you played through it? And they said, um, it's been about a month. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so long. Uh, okay, well, I'm gonna book a meeting where he sits down and everybody else sits down and uh, watches him play through it so that he, they can get his thoughts on it and they can maybe iterate on it. So we did that, they all sat down and. He sat down, he started playing it, and he's like, ugh, ugh, what? This is the worst content I've ever played in my life. And now, if you were told that <laughs> to, if you, and you've been working on something for a month, that isn't great. And there are a couple people that were really upset by this. So um, we had, I'd kind of talked to him afterwards and said, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do something called standing it up ugly, right? Which is, if, you're, if you work in websites, the, the wireframe, right? It is just the bare bones, how can we get this to, prove the point of what we're trying to do, but maybe it doesn't have the, the pizzazz or doesn't have the polish really that we're trying to look for yet. But you can see it if you can kind of imagine, oh yeah, when this guy hits this other guy in the face, there's gonna be like blood and explosions and all sorts of stuff, but maybe this standing it up ugly is just hits the guy in the face and it looks kind of janky because it hasn't had the support yet. Um, but we did that and afterwards we collected a bunch of action items and we said, okay, what was good about it and what was bad about it? and let's fix all the things that are bad about it, and we'll meet up next week, and we'll play test it again. Uh, and we did that again, and we, of course, the action items start to shrink over time, and things start to get better because people understand what the leads are looking for, and they also understand that uh, when they learn the lessons of what they don't like, they stop doing that as much, right? Which means they improve, and they get better, and they learn more stuff, which is awesome. It was painful to learn that experience, but after we did that, we started getting better results, which is awesome. So I'd highly recommend getting, standing it up ugly as a, as a thing if you were working on a, a bigger team and maybe need to uh, coordinate that stuff. So uh, another thing that, that I did that I think was helpful was using visual progress tracking. Um, what does that mean? That means that when you are showing somebody where you are at, it is on a very visual and easy to understand sort of basis. A lot of times producers get mired down in the cool things that you can do and stuff like Jira and uh, Handsoft and say like, look at all these graphs and charts. And usually people that are doing the, the fun stuff like art and design, they kind of don't care. What, what they care about is they just want to have, they just want to make the quests and they want to make the artwork and the animation and stuff like that. So one of the things that I did when I started working um, at Blizzard was we had a, um, I, I talked with them about their pipeline for making dungeons. So I, I said, you know, what does it take to make a dungeon? What do you need to do? And they're like, well, we need to do paper design, and then after paper design, we need to kind of vet that, and then after that, we start getting things implemented this way, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I mapped it out on a board, and then I started putting the dungeon names 
um, with the individuals who would do it. And it's pretty much like a, a Kanban board, which we'll, we'll talk about later. But it's just the pipeline of what that dungeon is. And so I started putting the dungeons and where they were in the pipeline in the process of making things. And so it kind of just kept going along. And uh, the lead of that team at the time came in and he said, what's this? And I'm like, oh, this is, this is where all the dungeons are. We're working on like nine dungeons right now. This one's uh, almost done. This one still has a long way to go, you know? And this one tells you basically how much time we have left and if we're spending too much time on stuff that it is in a bad state and we need to do something about it. And he's like, oh, this is useful. And I was like, yes. Yes, that is my job, is, is to make useful things for you so that you can see where things are at or problems are going to come up. So if you can do stuff where people don't feel like they need to analyze something heavily, um, basically make something that someone can look at very quickly and understand, I think it's very helpful, especially with working with creative folks that don't really care about production. Uh, know your audience. That's, it's kind of related to that in a way, but... Um, Another thing at Blizzard that uh, when I had first started I had noticed is they were very um, project management averse, right? When I talked to them, I said like, oh man, we can do all this stuff like sprint planning and we can do stuff like burn down tracking and we can do things like have retrospectives and I started kind of going nuts on all this, this producer talk and a lot of them were like, ah, that sounds like you're going to weigh us down with all sorts of stuff that isn't working on the game and that's scary, right? So uh, I still need to know where they're at so that I can communicate to my bosses that there is uh, a risk potentially or that they're going to deliver things on time or if they're, um, if they're on track or not. So we had to figure out a way to not weigh them down with huge amounts of process but still understand where they are in the pipeline. Um, and so that meant that we did a couple of stand-ups, but it wasn't like a ton of stand-ups every day for half an hour, right? It was just we'll, do, we'll try two a week and we'll see how it goes, right? And I made sure that I was, I was very clear and I'm not trying to weigh you down, I just wanna see where you're at in a very quick amount of time. Um, and that helped out with them actually a lot. I think a, a few people were kinda like, oh, this, is, this is actually kinda useful because we can find out where everybody's at in a very quick amount of time. Uh, so it's really about understanding where they're at and not saying, I know this process, this process works, and then pushing it on them because usually they don't react too well to that. So knowing your audience is a big thing. Uh, detective work to find out what sucks. So when you, this is more th at the beginning, um, and we'll talk more about postmortems and how they can help with this. But uh, typically, when I start at a new place, I try to ask, um, what are the things that you like about what you're doing right now, and what are the things you don't like about what you're doing right now? Um, and that's not from the sense of the content of what you're working on, like the quests themselves or something like that. It's more. Uh, is there a problem with how somebody has you doing something? Or do you feel weighed down by something? Or is, are you blocked by something? Or do you not get your stuff reviewed enough? Or do you get enough feedback, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So finding that stuff out is, is really helpful because it, it means that people will appreciate your ability to get stuff done because you'll find out what their problems are. Hopefully you can fix them uh, and kind of move on. So um, tracking and process. Um, forgive me if you have any sort of background in production management. This is probably going to be a little bit boring, but I wanted to talk about this stuff for people that may not know these processes. Um, and I'll try not to go too heavily into details because it, it can be like, uh, okay, I get it. Um, so task tracking programs, stuff like Jira. Um, has anybody in this room used Jira before? Awesome. Ah, great. Okay. So, yeah, definitely a lot of companies use stuff like Jira or Handsoft or Test Track Pro or lots of different things to track those projects. What that means is um, when you make something like a game, um, you need to find ways to break everything down into smaller chunks so that you can kind of say, where are we at with things? So, let's say, for example, we wanted to make, uh, we were making an RPG and we were making quests. Um, and so we would need to go to, say, the design team and say, how many quests do you have? Um, what is involved in this quest? Are there uh, props or things that you need? Like, I need a big pile of skulls, and I also need a king that's sitting on the pile of skulls. OK, so that means that we're going to need to get the art team to make a pile of skulls, and we're going to need the art team to make a king that sits atop this pile of skulls. Um, and so we need to do that. We also need to track the quest itself. You know, This is something that we need to do. Uh, how long we think it's going to take, you start to add all those things up over time, and that's just one individual's responsibility, but it's, or it's got about three different owners. So you start tracking those things, um, and this is how we sort of uh, track all of those tasks once they're up. We start using things like Scrum. 
Scrum uh, was started because there were people that didn't know where they were sort of in making games, or not games, uh, software. Um, and it was about identifying how we can track stuff and get more information about where we are. The idea was also to make it lightweight, although uh, a lot of people in the games industry seem to think that this is actually heavy in uh, some of the tracking. We'll talk about uh, some of the other stuff, which is not as heavy, but Scrum usually starts out with um, something called a, a sprint planning meeting, uh, where you kind of say, what are the things that we're going to do over the next two weeks? And we talk about that with the people that are actually doing it. And we say, what do we need to do? How long is it going to take? And we assign hours to those things. Uh, and we put them on boards that look like this. So we would say, oh, this is the new thing. This is uh, the analysis section. This is the design, the development, the QA. And so uh, we would say every day, 10 minutes, everybody that's working on this stuff will get up. This is called a stand-up meeting, where you kind of go in and say, um, OK, what are we doing? Uh, or what are you doing specifically? Um, are you blocked by anything? And then what's the next task that you're going to work on? And then you mark down the hours on each one of those things. And that comes back to the burn down chart, which is what we had talked about before, where you start to track those hours going down over time. Uh, and so you, the, the purpose of that stand up is not only to track the hours, but it's to find out if anybody has any problems. Um, there have been places where um, they did not use this method. And uh, you would talk to some people that maybe aren't as motivated as others. And uh, maybe it's been three days and they haven't done something. You go up to them and say, what, what's wrong? What's, what's going on? I'm like, oh, I can't do anything. The, this guy needs to give me this thing, otherwise I can't do anything. It's like, well, why didn't, why didn't you tell me? Some people are motivated, like heavily motivated. I am, when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, let's go, let's do the day, right? That, that is my thing. Not everybody is like that. And so that's what these stand-ups kind of serve to do, is to get these people to say, oh, I can't do this thing because this guy hasn't given me the, the item I need. Oh, OK, well, let's go get that done, right? So following up on that, and then um, as you track those things, you then have what's called a post-mortem. So you've delivered on all your tasks, or you have not. And you say, what went well, what went poorly, and uh, what can we improve? And we'll talk about a good post-mortem later. Um, so that's kind of a, a very quick version of that. And there are things that I'm sure I've certainly missed. Uh, and people that are huge scrum nerds can tell me later what I, what I said wrong about that. But um, uh, at, yeah. Um, so after, after that, we have something called Kanban. Kanban is, is what I would call like diet scrum. So you can do this uh, for things like live products. I think this is, uh, if, if you look at something like um, World of Warcraft, it's a live game, right? So when that game is live, there are things that break. And when those things break, we need to fix them. And if they are on fire bad, like somebody's like, I figured out how to duplicate gold. Like that's, <laughs> that's so bad, right? So we need to fix that very quickly. So um, let's say that QA finds that out or somebody uh, online finds out this bug uh, and we need to get it to the people that can fix it. And so with Kanban, it's, it's just about what is the thing that is most on fire right now? Let's triage that, right? Let's find out of all the list of things, what is on fire right now? Sweet God, let us get this done quickly, right? Uh, and so you get that to the right person and you get them working on it as fast as you can. They get it done, no more gold dupe bug, fantastic. Uh, and the next day, repeat, right? There's no sprint planning meeting, there's no post-mortem, it's just, this is what's on fire, please put the fire out. So that's, that's Kanban, sort of in a, a very quick explanation. Uh, waterfall is sort of the uh, old school method of doing software stuff, and, and certainly people still use Waterfall. Um, this is more for something like art. You, you know how long something is going to take. So um, you'd say, you know, this is what we need uh, for, uh, let's say that we were doing an art piece. Uh, it's that pile of skulls that we were talking about before. We'd say, identify what the pile of skulls is. Uh, we then have a description from the designer. It then goes to the artist to actually implement those pile of skulls. And maybe there's some iteration. So we can say, like, oh, the pile of skulls isn't big enough. It needs to be like 20 stories tall. Like, oh, OK. So we, we get that stuff. We go back. And then we get it into testing. And then we're good to go. Um, and that, this is for something that doesn't have a lot of things that come up that are different or change. Uh, it's just more of we know what it needs to do. It needs to go through this process. And not a lot of change. Um, yeah, so that's less meetings on, on things. That, this is kind of where Scrum kind of, in a way, kind of came from because it was, you're not as uh, involved on the day-to-day -day with talking with people. Uh, and lastly, we have Kaizen. Uh, Kaizen is um, Toyota's famous for using this, which is the plan, do, check, act method. Um, 
This is uh, when you go through something, you say, okay, here's what we're going to do to make things better. These are the action items we're going to do. You do them. Uh, you then check on them, make sure that everything functioned correctly, and then, uh, or at a little small slice of it, then you act on it, and then you do that cycle again. Right. So this is something you can also use Kaizen over something like Scrum or Kanban to kind of make sure that those things are good. Okay. Yes. Uh, no, it's. I would say it's popular. It depends on where you go. This is the the fascinating thing about the games industry is everywhere that you go, it's completely different. I've I've been at some places like Amazon was very strict Scrum when I was working there, but that was Amazon Orange County. I don't know how they ran things in Amazon games in Seattle or, or anywhere else, but when I was there, it was very strict by the books scrum. Um, some places they're like, what's a scrum, right? So it, it really depends on where you are. I've been at places where their production was, somebody would come by and be like, you guys good? Okay, and then, <laughs> and then they leave, uh, seriously. Um, but you know, that's, that's not like that everywhere, but uh, it changes. Uh, so adapting process to teams. This is uh, a, a big thing uh, for me um, in that, uh, similarly to what I was just talking about, there's no one process and not all teams are the same. Some teams uh, need a heavier amount of process. There's a quote from the Netflix CEO, and I'm gonna butcher the quote, so I'm sorry, but effectively he was saying more or unorganized teams need process to get stuff done. They don't know what to do, so we need to have people that say, this is what you will do. These are the steps that you will do things. Please do this this way, because they don't know. Um, but people that are exceptional at what they do, they don't need as much process because they know how to do the thing, right? So um, when you come into a team that's very strong and focused and understands what they're doing, you may not need to go as heavy on the process side of things because they are, they're going to feel way, weighed down, and they're probably not gonna want you to help them out because they're gonna say like, look, I got it, it's fine. I'm delivering on these things, what is the problem, right? And so adapting to those guys to help them out is a big part of being a producer that is, I think, helpful. Um, I've also done stuff where um, I had this idea once, so um, in Kanban they have this thing called work in progress limits or WIP limits. So the idea is that you can't work on 80 things at once, you can only work on one or two things. That's it, those are the work in progress limits. Um, and so I was reading this in a book. I, I read a lot about like, oh, I'm gonna read about Scrum or Kanban or whatever, and uh, I don't know why I'm talking like this. But um, so I'd read through, and I'd come into work the next day, and I'm like, guys, work in progress limits. We're gonna try it. It's gonna be awesome. And people are like, what are you talking about? That's the worst idea I've ever heard. And I'm like, why? Why is that bad? And somebody said, well, look, when we open tools up to make certain pieces of content, we need to open up like 19 of them to get them working. And once we get that stuff working, then we can do that stuff. And we have to have these four quests up because otherwise if we closed everything and got everything out, it would waste time. I said, okay, that's fair. That's totally fair, right? Although I read it in a book does not mean that 100% it will work all the time. So I had to adapt to that team and say, okay, fine, we won't do this, but maybe not do like 90 things, maybe. And so it's about adjusting and adapting to those things. Uh, take what works, lose what doesn't. Um, in the Scrum process, for example, there might be stuff that is maybe too heavy or too high level of uh, really caring from the dev team's perspective. Um, and so, you know, if you, I was talking earlier about the stand-ups, um, I said, okay, well, we'll do two stand-ups a week instead of five for one of the teams that I was working with, just to make sure that they were useful and helpful. Um, and that team was more appreciative of that stuff, and they also learned the value of those, and so we started adding more once that had happened, right? So I think um, adapting to them is, is helpful in that regard. Um, also, experiment, try stuff, read about things, see what happens when you introduce them in the environment. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Again, lose it if it doesn't, um, and fail fast, right? So if you're gonna try something, make sure that that process fails quickly and it doesn't fail in like a year, that's not good. Uh, so fostering creativity. So uh, a big part of when you work with game designers is they're trying to find the fun. There's no one theory that says, this is how you make a video game fun. Fun is a very difficult thing to identify and figure out. And different games have different ways of making fun. And so when you're, uh, 
going through the process of figuring that stuff out, and this changes through the development of product. When you start out at the very beginning of making a game, you still need to understand what the game is and identify it and identify what that fun actually is. Uh, and so you need to leave time for that. And so you need to have playtests and iteration in your process. So when you start out, let's say that we were, uh, were coming up with a game. It's about uh, being a cowboy in the Old West, and it's like a, an RPG or something. And uh, we need to do things as a cowboy that are fun. So we come up with some ideas, and we design them out, and we get it in the game, and we play it, and it plays like crap. It's terrible. And we, ha we need to figure out like why that is terrible, because in theory, that sounds cool. I want to go hunt bad guys or like rob trains or do stuff like that. So we need to figure out what it is that we need to improve. And so that means we need to get it in front of people as quickly as we can, we need to try it, we need to figure out what's bad, get rid of that, and repeat. And you get to a point of where you try it once, ah, it doesn't work, okay, let's go back, fix it. And until you get to that point of understanding what that formula is for your game, uh, it's, this is highly paramount. And in, even continuing, it's, it's highly paramount. And also figuring out the action items is a, it's a big, big thing. So when you are having your play test, people will go through and they should be writing notes or you should have a producer in there to take the notes. So if somebody's like, <laughs> this is stupid, you need to go, okay, why is that stupid? What is stupid according to you? And then they can say like, well, I don't like it when the guy like lassos me and then drag me, drags me behind the horse. Okay, and then you need to have that discussion of is that mechanic worth it, or is it fun, or is it bad? Um, and then you need to do something about it. So you need to find the person that is responsible for that content. You need to assign them this task and say, please fix these things based off of that. Um, and then also having a meeting after your play test is hugely important. So when you're all playing through the stuff and everybody can say, you know, I liked this, I didn't like that, that's where you can collect your action items. And when people get those action items, they understand why they're getting them, and they understand why they're important to fix. Um, and then, yeah, play test again after that. So basically saying, what did we do from last time? What did we fix? Is this in a state where it feels pretty good and we can just go to polish? Then if so, awesome, let's just polish. And if not, let's, again, go through this process. Uh, and then approvals. So leads need to see this stuff. So your team that's working together, they need to figure out, once they're in a spot where they're happy with the content, they can then show it to a lead. Uh, and then the lead needs to say, like, yep, this is really cool or, oh my gosh, what have you guys been doing for this amount of time, right? Um, and so that's very important. So including those in your process and making sure that they're not too late, again, so they didn't spend three months working on something to only have the lead come in and say, do it again. Uh, and this, this final one, I think, is um, paramount. Uh, something, did you guys play Destiny at all, the game? Yeah, some people? Um, De you're like, uh, yes. Uh, some people seem ashamed. I love that game. Destiny's awesome. Um, so Destiny, the first game, they were rushing really hard to get that game out. They were just, they were working, working, working up until the very end, and then they shipped it, and then it came out, right? Um, the second game, they felt uh, something that they had learned was, we need to have time to just play this game like a player would play it. Um, and I know that sounds uh, like, duh, you should play like a player would play it. But when you're making a game, you're, you're so laser focused on certain things that you don't do the overall experience. In something like Destiny, you go to a hub, you talk with a person, they send you on a quest, you, know, you go do the thing, you shoot bad guys, and you come back and you get your reward. Um, but you also may PvP after that, and you also may go on a raid with somebody after that. The experience is kind of multifaceted, so when you're playing it, you should play it like a player would play it. And so you need to leave time at the end of your game cycle to say, we'll get it done by this point. We don't need to ship it by this point, but we need to get it done by this point to where we can be like, yeah, if we had to ship this, we could. But we still need that time to understand, is it good? And so that the leadership and the team can play through the game, go home, play it like a player, come back in the next day and you go, you know what sucks? The drop rate on this thing is terrible. Okay, well, we can update that. We have the time to do that. So. Uh, this isn't always something that people can do. Sometimes you have to take a project and you have to have it done in six weeks and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it and you've taken too long and you just need to get it out by the time. That's unfortunate because usually you'll get a better product when you can get the time to kind of do that stuff at the end. Uh, and postmortems. We, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, by the way, don't Google postmortem. Gross, gross images came up. I'm like, what can I put for this? Oh, God. Uh, so 
I put this Iron Maiden cover because I love Iron Maiden. So, um, and he's like post death. Retrospective, I, but it's not as metal. I love metal, man. You know what I'm saying? So, I had to do that. Yeah. So, um, postmortems or retrospectives uh, have the what went well, what could have been better, and what should we start doing, stop doing, and then the top three action items. So, um, it's one thing to have these, right? Step one is do this. Um, step two is the next time that you do a postmortem. So, after you figure out all these things, you need to come back and say, on these top three action items that we collected last time, did we actually do those things? So let's say that uh, one of the uh, action items is um, we didn't leave enough time for test. Okay, well, the next time that we do our sprint planning, we need to leave a little bit more time and maybe not assign everything to the very last minute. Um, and if you didn't do that, then that action item stays there and you need to do it until it is gone because you've accomplished that action item. So I think that that's, uh, that's worth saying because I've, I've done a lot of postmortems where um, we figure out all these things and we write them all down and we send out the email and we say like, ah, we did it, we did the postmortem, guys, but we didn't actually do anything about it. So doing something about it is a, is a big part of that. And again, a lot of times, like I know these things sound like, well, duh, but man, you get lost in the mire of, of tracking things and figuring stuff out. It's sometimes you just, you need that reminder. Uh, and that's it. That is the presentation. I, I want to leave it open for questions if you guys have any questions about the presentation or about games or anything else. Yeah. Well, I can't speak for everybody, but um, I can talk about a few things that I've found interesting over the past couple of years. So are, are you guys familiar with the term early access? Yeah, early access is a new thing. It's, a, I would say, a hot button issue. Actually, so I'm wearing this shirt. This is Darkest Dungeon. This is a great game. It's, it's a fantastic game. This was an early access game. Um, a, Yeah, it is. Yeah, I would say it's not a AAA developed title, but um, but the thing that was interesting about what these guys did is the Kickstarter was here's what we want to do. It's going to be awesome, and they did this great setup and pitch video, and everybody loved it. They got all their money. Good for them. They mm -hmm. then developed the game until it was feature complete, not content complete, but feature complete. Meaning you could play through that game and say like, oh yeah, this is the game. I get it. But it may not have all of the levels, or it may not have. Uh, maybe all the characters, but it, it is still a representation of what that game is. So from my perspective, if people want to continue to do early access, or PUBG, have you guys played PUBG? Player Unknown's Battlegrounds? I know what it is, and it's one of the most popular games there is. Yes, I think it's over 15 million copies have been sold of that game. It's not out of early access and it still qualifies for the awards. Yes. Award. There are lots of people that have nominated it as Game of the Year because I think it was available in March and it sold 15 million copies since then. Uh, now, that, that game has bugs, that game has some issues, um, but it is also incredibly fun and you can see what the core is of that game. So early access to me is kind of, it depends on how you do it. Some people, they, they run out of money or they run out of time and they just they put up whatever they can because they need to make that money back and then develop the game from the, the money that they are getting. It's not as healthy, uh, obviously, because then the players then... Because basically when you launch a game, you are basically saying uh, in early access, you're like, here is the game at its core of what it is. And so a lot of people are going to be like, oh, new game, sweet, and they'll play it, and they'll be like, oh, there's lots of bugs, and this is... Ugh, I don't like this. And they'll, they'll leave and they'll not come back. And even if you, if you launch, right, you, let's say it's a year later, you're out of early access and you've now launched the game, the hype that you had is gone. And, and the impression that players got is from that thing. So even if your game is remarkably better, it's still gonna suffer from that sort of perception. So early access is the thing um, that I see evolving and, and hopefully improving. Um, Steam has gone through a lot of different iterations on that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one way and one direction. I think another direction is you, know, you just see what 
AAA development has always been, which is here's the core game, and then eventually we'll do expansions or sequels. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I don't want to get into to commenting too much about that. Uh, obviously, EA made a mistake. You know, they they should not have made the MTX. Yeah, I, well, I mean, they the first Battlefront sold something like 14 million copies. Amazing, right? And so, them adding the MTX on top of a full box price, I think EA probably learned a pretty valuable lesson about. Um, what fairness means to gamers and uh, and what they're trying to do. So, hey, let's hope. Yeah, yeah. Do I do a lot of overtime? Um, recently, no. Um, there are certain games that I worked on where, I, yeah, I did a lot. Um, WildStar, uh, I worked a, a lot of overtime hours to get that game out the door. Um, I am, uh, you know, at this new spot, uh, I'm in a very lucky position in that uh, being the creative director, I can help identify the culture uh, and the environment that we're working with in games. And so one of the big things to me is, uh, you know, you saw a picture of my son. I like seeing him and, and hanging out with him and stuff, and same with my wife. So we're, we're trying to have a culture where we don't go crazy into that, and we're trying to do our planning as, as best we can to not have as much crunch. But uh, it's definitely part of it, um, and I know certain studios uh, thrive on it, and uh, that's great for them. And uh, I've I've also noticed that um, I've been at a couple of places where they say, "Well, this is always how we do it. This is this is the only way that it works." Like, so of course we're going to continue to crunch. I think that that's um, that's interesting. Uh, but uh, the way that I would look at it is, you can always improve. You can always be better. Um, so some people thrive in the chaos of working ridiculous hours and last minute stuff. But uh, I'm not a big fan of it personally. Yeah. Yeah, it's slightly different. I, I think um, program manager, project manager, um, producer, uh, it, it changes role to role on, on different locations of different companies. Um, so I think if outside of games, um, I think it's very similar, except that they probably adapt less to the, the finickiness of the product. If the product, uh, it depends on the scope and what you're trying to accomplish. But a lot of times, uh, like a website, for example, if you were a PM at a website, uh, usually websites are not super crazy different, right? They, you click on the buttons, the buttons do the thing. Maybe the order in which you are putting the buttons in is there, but, but it's not like, this isn't fun, do it again, scrap it, okay. Uh, do it again, it's still not fun, uh, I mean, I think it's a little bit more um, focused on understanding that development uh, as a producer, but there are certainly project management aspects of it, the Scrum, Kanban, Jira tracking, that sort of thing. Any other questions? Yeah. So um, I'm not a, a huge proponent of Waterfall personally. Um, I, I think if, if, there are, um, if there are games that have established what they are and you know how long it takes to make the content, I could see Waterfall potentially working. Um, so for example, if we were making a mobile game and the mobile game is about uh, pets or something. Uh, I have a pet store and I add new pets all the time and we've had this game out for two years and we know how long it takes to add a kitty or a puppy or a horsey or I don't know why I keep using little kid words, but basically you understand what it takes. Um, there's no weird variables, there's no weird changing, it's just we're adding content. I could see Waterfall working in an environment like that, like I know it takes two days to make the art, I know it takes one day to implement it, I know it takes one day to write all the stats about this you know, pet. Um, and then that's it, but, but, but even then, I think from my perspective, I think the advantage of something like Scrum is you can talk with people regularly to find out if there are problems. Usually there are less problems in an environment like that, so something like Waterfall can work, but it's still good to, to reach out to people on the regular without bugging them too much, so, yeah. Any other questions? 
Well, cool. If you guys want to talk to me uh, right now, I'm, I'm free for a little bit. And or reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Stefan Frost or uh, add me on LinkedIn. Thanks a lot for coming, guys. Appreciate it.